just about the heart. It's about keeping everything healthy. If I, if I could all ask you to indulge me, just hold up your hand like this with your fist, if you don't mind. You don't have to hold it too high. You just have a look at it. That's the size of your heart. That's all it is. It sits here in your chest. It's not on the left hand side, it's right in the middle, but points to the left. So everyone thinks the heart's right on the left hand side, it's not. Right in there. And everything starts and stops with your heart. If your heart stops, that's the end of it. When your heart starts, you're awake. And we can bring people back to life, and I'll show you that as well, when your heart starts again, if it has stopped. We also live in a fantastic age where we can do all kinds of stuff and we're able to treat all kinds of diseases. But we're not where Star Trek is either, you know, where you can just put a, a little zapping machine over and heal everything or make di diagnosis. So there are a few things that we need to do. But once again, this heart, this pump, it goes like that, and that's how everything starts. And on top of that heart, a little artery sits on top of it. And this is what most people are afraid of, getting a heart attack. And if you know, a heart attack starts with a blockage in the artery. I'm going to show you a little bit about all this in due course. And the topic today is how to catch a heart attack before it catches you. The reason I have chosen this is because everyone always tells me, how can I stop myself from having a heart attack? It's not just a heart attack. The causes of a heart attack and a stroke are pretty similar. So if you can stop a heart attack, you do the right thing to stop a stroke. A cardiovascular, cardio meaning heart, vascular meaning vessels, cardiovascular disease is the biggest killer worldwide, and even for women. And I'm truly honored today because I think this is the first time I've ever given a talk, apart from you, Cola, where everybody in the audience seems to be female. <laughs> I don't think I've done this ever before. Anyway, not such a large audience. So, this is a picture of me and my dad. So we're two generations of the same uh, cardiologists. We've been trying to treat heart disease in this part of the town for uh, a number of decades. And the guy on the... No, I'm gonna hope that this works, yes. I'm not pressing the wrong button, don't worry. The guy over here is a young guy, he's 35 years old. At that time, a good friend of mine, actually, he came out in the newspapers. And he had a heart attack, he had blocks through a lot of arteries. We managed to fix them for him. And then he went around telling people his story and what they needed to do to prevent themselves from having a heart attack as well. And that was keeping healthy. And what we've done over the last few thousand years is we've changed nature. We've changed the way we live. And I'm going to show you that a little bit later on as well. And if we go back to the way we should be living, we reduce our risk. The problem is, once damage is done, it tends to stay there. So this guy at the age of 35, and you might think 35 is really young. Anybody here can hazard a guess as to the youngest, or the age of the youngest heart attack patient I've ever seen, or treated. Okay, I'm just asking you to think about it. 19 years old. 19 years old. And the reason is, he never had his, any check. And I tell a lot of people, when you have teenage kids, ask them to get their cholesterol checked in their mid-teens. Because you might have a familial high cholesterol. Again, this guy's cholesterol is to the roof. 19 years old, one to you. Okay? And why should we be concerned about having heart attacks or heart problems or anything like that? Because sudden cardiac death can happen to anyone. Anyone. One to two Singaporeans under the age of 60 die from cardiac arrest every day. We don't hear about it. Okay, and it occurs without warning, and most of the time, the first sign or symptom is when you have that heart attack. Okay? I'm not trying to scare you, just trying to tell you the truth. Okay? And I'm going to tell you how you can prevent it, so don't worry. Alright? And we get it with football players too, young guys. And it's not a heart attack that they get, but what they get is sudden cardiac arrest, because they've got some kind of congenital problem. They haven't been checked. I'm involved with Singapore football. I know it's a bad word these days in the newspapers, but I'm involved with Singapore football. We scream. Um, players before they go in, especially at the professional level. The same way we screen army people before they go in, the young boys go into the army. But we get 18, 19 year old people collapsing. We get people who run marathons. You've heard about this as well. Yeah, most of you have read about this. And these guys run marathons regularly, it's just that one day they push themselves too hard, and something that was undetected prior to that has come up and acted. Okay? So, 80% sudden cardiac death are due to chronic artery disease. This is what your artery looks like. I told you about your heart and your pump and all the vessels that sit on top. Your heart pumps blood to itself. 
into the muscle, and that blood carries oxygen. You need that oxygen, okay? So if you've got lack of oxygen from a block in one of the heart arteries, you start to get pain. We don't always get pain. And especially in ladies, and you'll find that ladies tend to have different symptoms sometimes, eight different symptoms. If there's a block here and you do get pain, it's the same as if you exercise and you can't get enough oxygen in to, the, to your muscle in your arms, you start getting an ache. That's how it often starts. But the first sign sometimes might be breathlessness. And sometimes the first sign is the first heart attack. The same way you get blocks in the heart artery, you can get blocks in the neck arteries. And so what you have is a pump and a whole load of pipes. And that's what we do. We deal with the pump and pipe. Okay, so in a way, I'm a plumber. I treat people's plumbing. I only do the plumbing from here to here, then, okay? Just in case you don't know. I'm not doing any other plumbing anywhere else. The cholesterol bar builds up on the inside. And once it builds, you can't remove it. You can make it smaller, but you can't remove it. Everyone can hear me well enough in the back. Are we good around there? Are we all right? Yeah, both sides? Yeah, okay. So, once this starts, there's an accelerated growth phase. And that's why when people have blocks, you'll find your doctor's going to put you on medication. That's the only thing that's been proven to prevent progression. Once a blockage is there. Okay? And medication saves your life. Cholesterol medication. We'll talk a little bit about cholesterol later on as well. So, what we tend to do is look for blocks. If you have blocks in one part of your house, in the pipes, you tend to have it in other places too. This, heart arteries, neck arteries. So I often scan people's neck arteries. If I see cholesterol build up in there, I know there's going to be blocks elsewhere too. So causes hmm, of heart attack, smoking, diabetes. You can run through this list, obesity, high blood pressure. These are all risk factors. Sleep apnea too. If you snore a lot, you're putting your heart under strain. There's a whole load of these risk factors in there. But most of them, and a lot of them, are modifiable. All you have to do is smoking and stop. Very simple. Not so simple to do. Yeah? High cholesterol, you can treat it. High blood pressure, you can treat it. You gotta lose weight. Diabetes, very treatable with medication. Okay? But men and women are both at risk. And most of the time, most of you will think, ah, it's the guys who are gonna get the heart attack where women were protected. That's not necessarily true. Especially women are on a perimenopausal phase. When you're near menopause, you start to get a catch-up. When you're post-menopause, that catch-up is there. And that's when you start to get increased risk. But I've treated patients, ladies who come in in their 20s, with blocks in their heart arteries and heart attacks too. So the first thing you're going to do is get to your doctor and get your cholesterol checked. If your cholesterol is high, you need to start doing other tests to figure out whether it's caused a problem, how long you've had the problem. Okay? And, there's, and there's loads of WhatsApp messages being thrown about saying cholesterol does not cause blockages. I would love to know. How many of you received those messages? Anyone? There's messages being sent out on WhatsApp saying cholesterol does not cause blockages. That's not true. Cholesterol does cause blockages. Okay? The FDA has never said, and there's, a, there's another message that tends to be bandied about, that the FDA has said that cho ingesting cholesterol is, uh, makes no difference. Cholesterol does not cause blocks. That's not true, that's someone misinterpreting what the most recent messages from the medical community have been. Okay? So what we know with women, okay, that as they age, the risk of heart disease goes up, the risk of stroke goes up. And I told you there's this catch-up phase. Okay? Cardiovascular disease, if you take heart and stroke together, is the biggest killer worldwide. That's what we want to prevent. And cancer too, of course. You treat these two, and I think we've come a long way. And what's important is, most of the time we recognize males in white, okay? Sorry, males in red, females in white. We start targeting the males, we start treating the males, we forget about the females. And as a result, females have continued, deaths in thousands, to increase. And at some point, they started to equate with the men, or even overtake. In recent times, we started identifying females or ladies with heart disease, and now their risk has come down with treatment, medical therapy. Menopause, I mentioned menopause. Just remember, after menopause, at whatever age you are, the risk goes up. 
But just, and the problem is that many ladies we see around the time of menopause, they get all kinds of symptoms, palpitations, heart flashes, things like that. And you tend to get a little bit of a crossover. And then there's this gray area where you can't figure out if it's the heart or if you're going through the change, if you will. Okay? That's the time you need to get checked. Because sometimes the other symptoms tend to mask the real thing. So women at risk, same as everywhere, establish heart disease, blockage of carotid and neck artery, circulation problem, all kinds of other stuff. But we'll, we'll go through all that later on. Okay? Most women are at risk at some point if they lead a modern lifestyle. If you sit behind a desk most of the day, you're at risk. And you tend to get things like shortness of breath, fatigue, lightheadedness. What everybody thinks is gastric pain. 20-30% of the time, it is a heart issue. I had one lady who came in to see us, and about two weeks before, she was getting jaw pain, or rather ache, and what she thought was a toothache. She kept going to see a dentist, and dentist said, nothing wrong, checked two or three times. When I saw another dentist as well, because it was really excruciating pain, it was coming and going. And at one point, the pain got so bad, she went to the A&E department at Mount Elizabeth Hospital. Went in there, and, some, and a smart medical officer decided, you know, this jaw pain, he asked, are you getting breathless? Yeah, breathless too, but probably from the pain. Did an ECG. She was having a heart attack, because that severe excruciating pain was from a heart attack. And the reason is, all your nerves run through here. And people wire differently. The wires go up and down, and some of the wires just lead up to here. And for some people, it is just a jaw pain. So it's not necessarily too thick. So you may say, oh my god, now any symptom could be a heart problem. What it is, is I'm telling you to look out for it, okay? I'm not trying to give you a free time. If you're pain in your toe, it most likely isn't, okay? All right? But if you get a toothache, okay, get it checked first. If it persists and you have other symptoms, you don't feel well, get it checked out by a doctor as well. And if you're worried, get an ECG done. And if you're really, really worried, I'm just down the road anyway. You can come and see me. Okay? So look out for this kind of stuff. Okay? Lots of different unusual signs. Weeks before, fatigue, sleep disturbance, shortness of breath. This is described just about everything you might be feeling during the week. Okay? But it's pretty much the same. Chest pain. Everyone's heard about it. You know, the classic is like chest pain here going down your arm. Look out for it. Okay? And what we need to know, and I'm checking the time now, so you want to, I started 10 minutes late, so give me 10 minutes more, okay? Genetic factors. Indians, three times higher risk of heart disease compared to the Chinese. Malays were two times. The Malays have caught up, and the Chinese have caught up. This is data from five years ago. The Chinese start eating a lot of Indian food, and now things have changed. <laughs> All right, so here we go. What are your genes? They're your practices over the last few thousand years, manifesting in your body, in your genetic makeup, being passed down to other people. Okay, so remember that. You can change a few things, but not your genes. So what can we do? Lifestyle changes. Health screening. Medication is recommended by a cardiac. Okay, this is just me saying, listen to me, but by a doctor anyway. And if you need to, procedures. Medicine is not poison. Okay, a lot of people, you see a lot of stuff in the, in the news saying, oh, don't take cholesterol tablets. You know, and then by the side, there'll be an advertisement for some other supplements. Okay, so beware. There's always a lobby for different kinds of things. And until we find something better, the cholesterol tablets are the best thing we have. And then learn how to switch from this to this. And you all know, I don't have to tell you what foods are good. You know. If it tastes really good, it's bad for you. Okay? If it tastes really bad, it's spoiled. Don't eat it either. Okay? But go for healthy food. Do the things you need to do. Relax. Visit the doctor regularly. Your bosses are not that I'm up here, so it's all right. I can say relax. Try and get some time to relax your work too. Okay? Visit the doctor regularly. Check your weight. Do all this stuff. Okay? Make sure you burn more calories than you take in. It's simple. People say, what kind of diet, doc? Should I change from green nuts to blue nuts? You know? It doesn't work that way. It's calories. You burn more. It goes away. All right? And a healthy plate. Everybody knows this. This has been drilled into you from school times. Okay? 
And then you know about the good cholesterol and the bad. Everyone knows there's a good cholesterol and bad cholesterol, right? So keep the bad as low as possible, keep the good as high as possible. All of you ladies in here, you're lucky. You're born with higher good cholesterol. But you can undo it. <laughs> Alright? So you're lucky that way. But it doesn't mean it doesn't mean that your cholesterol, good cholesterol being high, means that you can undo the bad cholesterol being high. It's not a one-to-one -one relationship. Okay, I'm just going to use some quick levels and then I'm going to go into all the good stuff very quickly. This is what the Singapore guidelines tell you to do. If you run with an LDL of bad cholesterol less than 130, and let's say you run between 100 and 130, you'll get a block someday. So you have to run lower than that. And the reason for that is animals, children who need cholesterol to grow in their growth, growth phases, the bad cholesterol is 50. It's one third of what the guidelines tell you. So everybody ends up with a block. I've seen only one 80 year old patient with no blocks anywhere. Okay? She was a lady, of course. It's the only patient I've seen out of thousands. But if you have a small block, you can prevent the small block becoming a big block. Right? Bad cholesterol. You can take a picture, actually, you don't have to take pictures in here. There's a few little booklets of everything in it. You probably know my talk anyway because you've seen it, right? In the book? No? Nobody's read it, I'm sure. All right. Anyway, so less than 50. Bad cholesterol, LDL, good cholesterol, HDL. Okay? So just remember these numbers. Try and get the bad ones as low as possible. And then we're winning. But cholesterol is not the whole story. There's so many other risk factors, I told you, right? These people, Amazon drug, very recently, a new study showing the Somali people with the healthiest hearts. Guess what their cholesterol is running at? Near 50 for the bad cholesterol. Healthiest heart, kill on the newspapers, genetic makeup. These people have not led a modern lifestyle. They're living out there in the jungle, they're running around for 10 hours a day. How many of you exercise 10 hours a day? Please throw up your hand. 10 hours a week, see, no chance, right, very little, okay, but that's what they do, so genetically, that's what they've done, and so what we've done in medicine is we found a way to target genetics, there is a group of people, oops, okay, good, there's a group of people who are born with a gene where they can produce bad cholesterol, aren't they lucky, so we studied that, those people, and then we found that we can target that gene and knock it out. That's what this new drug is. Has anyone seen this in newspapers? A new injectable form of cholesterol drug to reduce cholesterol. Okay, this is the crowd where nobody actually reads the uh, cholesterol stuff. That's okay, I understand. You're all young ladies, you're not worried about it. You know, fair enough. It's usually all the guys who worry about it, right? Okay, but it's expensive drug. It knocks out most of the LDL. You can drop it down to less than even 10. I told you 50. These people almost have no heart disease, and that's the proof that the cholesterol medication works. And we've done studies with this drug as well. We drop it right down to almost zero. It doesn't affect your memory. There's papers published. So all the, don't believe all the stuff you read on the internet. Okay? So I told you what you can do. Right? Remember this slide. Okay? So what do you do? You start screening. Okay, we're 20 minutes in. I've got another 40. Okay? See the right doctor, okay? We'll do the right test for you at the end of the day. You'll know who the good ones are in, all right? If you go in for a general screen in the polyclinic, it's great, okay? They'll do what they need to do very minimum. And in fact, there's a new scheme rolled out where they do a simple health screen for like five or 10 bucks, I can't remember. Five bucks, that's great, but it's very simple. But it's a good first start, you can try with that. But then if you ask them to try and investigate further, it's not gonna cost you five bucks, okay? It doesn't cost that much. But, do that first. And you'll find that some of these things are a bit out of whack. And then you got to address them. Okay, so see the right person. And then do the tests that you need to as appropriate. People invest so much money in other things, they forget to invest in their health. A few tests cost a few hundred bucks. Okay? It isn't even the, the price of a handbag you carry. I'm pretty sure. Okay? <laughs> and you got ten handbags. Okay, fine. You give up one. Buy nine instead. You'll be alright. And I tell the guys the same things as well, you know. They buy a bunch of watches and all that. You know, you can, you can afford to do a check for yourself. And it goes a long way because it's going to save you a lot of money in the future. 
And then if you need to, do tests like an x-ray or a treadmill. There are lots of tests that we can do. An ECG is a basic test. And most people tell me, Doc, I've done my check. Okay, I've done it. So what do you do? Ah, uh, yeah, they check my sugar, my cholesterol, and they did an ECG. I do that every year. You will miss 50% of blockages or more doing just that. ECG is a good first baseline test. Putting electrodes in your chest, but it doesn't tell you the whole story. It's a good first test. And there's always an escalation protocol in terms of tests that you do based on your risk profile. Treadmills. Uh, people tell me, I've done normal treadmill for 10 years now in a row. You know, I never had heart problems before. That doesn't mean you're not going to have a heart problem now because you're getting older. And treadmills are 70% accurate. Meaning, 30% of the time, they're wrong. That's why you need to do other tests sometimes too. This guy is 50 years old. He was 50 years old when he did this test anyway, okay? And most people think they're invincible because they're about 60, 70. This guy is super fit, muscles, all that kind of stuff, yeah? That's his heart, showing a block in the heart artery. Came out in Time Magazine, it's more than 10 years ago we started doing CT scans of the heart arteries. Okay? And they find out blocks in a lot of people. I'm not saying everybody needs to do a CT scan, but your loved ones, yourselves, your loved ones, people you work with, your co-workers, your friends, some of them are going to need to go down the path of doing further tests. And that's why you're here gathering this information as well. He's 50 here. Actually, that's only two years older than I am, okay? So I've done my CT scan two years ago, okay? Because we're doctors, we're also worried about our own health. People say, oh, you know what to do anyway. Knowing what to do doesn't mean you actually do it. And that's the problem. Okay? So this guy was a marathon runner. Found a block, stented, went out and ran a marathon again. And these are the things. Once you have a heart attack, or even a blockage in the heart arteries, it doesn't mean you can't lead a normal life. What we do routinely sometimes in our clinic is an echo, an ultrasound scan of the heart. This is someone's heart with valves opening and closing, clapping hands here and there. Can you see that? They're valves. They regulate flow. This is a carotid ultrasound looking at the neck arteries. It's the first place cholesterol tends to build up. If you do a scan of this and you find blocks, anybody with 30% or more, you really need to have a look at your heart arteries. 30% blocks. This is clean, right? This is clean, normal heart. Okay? What I'm showing you is the structure, the four chambers. Don't need to worry, this is not going back to school, alright? It does, it does remind you of school though, doesn't it? <laughs> Some people have done, okay, don't worry, I won't test you. Okay, these are the chambers in the heart. If you've got high blood pressure, your heart gets thicker. You've heard about this before. Okay? And this is what we do in ultrasound. Four chambers. One, two, three, four chambers. And this, can you see, this one's much weaker compared to here. You see the squeezing my dot? These are things that we can do with the pump function in the heart. Okay? A treadmill can't tell you that. An ECG can't tell you that. Okay? We look at valves to see if the valves have leakages. And then we scan the neck arteries, normal. And can you see this little mountain here? You can see this blood flow that's somewhat constricted. There's only a little trickle going through there. That's a block in the neck arteries. One of our ladies, we have to stent that. So by the way, we stent everything. I told you I'm a plumber, right? And I told you that I, that I do it. What do you hear to hear? That's not true. We actually go a bit further, okay? Neck arteries sometimes, leg arteries even the abdominal aorta. I try not to do the stuff in the nether regions, but you know, sometimes we have to step those two, okay? But this is someone with a big block. So we can fix it. And if you need other tests, so most of the time, you say people get heart, you're worried about heart attack, chest pain, blockages in the heart arteries. Many people come with palpitations. Okay, feeling your heart beating irregularly. What do we do? We can strap in the old days, we could, if you go, in the old days, we used to strap on a Batman utility belt with a whole load of electrodes. Nowadays, with cool little devices like this that we can hang around your neck and make you look a bit like Iron Man. <laughs> it is. Some people like this. They have to borrow it from time to time. But, small electrodes. But even this is outdone by what we have now, which is this. Small devices like this we can stick on for weeks on end and monitor your heart rhythm and find out if your heart's not beating right. And you can take nice photos like this with it <laughs> on the beach. If you want to check your blood pressure, you check it at home, you don't know if it's real or not. You get blood pressure machines and you can strap on and keep taking your pressure. 
But this is a watch that you can, that you can use. You can't buy this watch, unfortunately. It comes with an algorithm. Okay, we wrote the paper on this when I used to be a National Heart Center. I used to be the government hospital 15 years ago. So this guy's making lots of money from a paper that I wrote that I have no share in. Okay, just in case. Okay, but you can check blood pressure and see if the pressure is correct. See if it's inaccurate. See if you know you're getting a variation during the day. And then I mentioned CT scans earlier on. I've done one. Most of us have. And I'm telling you I've done it and tell you that it's normal, okay? So in case you've got oh, that doctor, you have a CT scan, he's got blocks. I've got no blocks, all right? But you want to know the other Sometimes CT scans give you a lot of information. This is blood going through the arteries, a normal, normal artery, and blocks. Can everyone see that? The trickle is like that going through. Right? You can see it up here. Yeah, I've, I've been neglecting this side, sorry, I'll point here for you as well. Okay? This area here. Alright? And what you have is hard plaque, which is calcium. Calcified, your body's way of healing itself. And the soft plaque. And the whole thing reduces blood flow. And then we get beautiful images like this, three-dimensional reconstruction of the whole arteries coming out. And you can see the difference between this and this. Okay, it's a little bit for time. This is a small trickle going through and a blockage. I give this to most of my patients. Some of them frame them up actually because they're quite pretty pictures. And they're free. They don't have to pay for them after that. No, it costs about a thousand bucks for this test. But it's well worth it. And the radiation is tiny. Everyone's worried about radiation. Oh, this is horrible. We shouldn't get the radiation. Every time I do a balloon instead, I get three times the radiation that you would get doing a CT scan for myself. Do you know that living on Earth, I must stop pressing that. Living on Earth, you get 300 chest x rays in most places. Singapore is about 350. Delhi and uh, Beijing is about 400. If you lived in Bhutan, somewhere it might be about 250. So, one CT scan is the difference between living in Bhutan and Beijing for one year. That's it. Or you give them three months of living on Earth. The radiation dose is really small. But the information you get from it is great. And that's where this is low dose CTA compared to all the other tests, including angiograms and all that other stuff, just to show you that it's not so dangerous after all. If you need to do the test. Okay? And then if you really need to know if you've got a bot, we do something called an angiogram. Has everyone here heard about an angiogram? You've heard about it? Oh, good. I care if you guess it's here and there. You hear about people putting a catheter up the leg and going up and jetting die, having a look to see this box. Okay? You don't always have to do it through the leg. I, for the last 10, 15 years, I've been doing it mostly for my patients, through the arm. In and out, they walk straight away. But it is the newer way, we'll tell you a little bit about it. But we can see the artery directly. This is closer to 100% accurate to the box. Okay, this is us conducting the course that we do every year with the National Heart Center as well. Okay, this is, my, this is one of my teachers. So we, it was a great thing for me to get to do a case with him live once. So this is how we dress. And then, you pass the catheter up here, up through here, into the artery, onto the block, and open it up. Okay? What you're going to see is what a block looks like. Catheter, look at this area here, similar to the next picture, that's your block. Lack of blood flow going through. Catheter inside, normal artery. Can you see that? Nice and clean. Everyone can see it, no? And then, this is a block. Can you see the difference? Yeah? The flow is compromised. So what do we do with this? We balloon it. 99% of our patients do not need bypass surgery. We can send them, we can, we can fix most things because we have the technology and the know-how these days. You got a block like that, we can fix it. Medication, angioplasty, or stenting, ballooning, or stenting, as it's called. You've all heard of this. An angiogram is a diagnostic test. Angioplasty is when we fix it. Then you have bypass surgery as an option as well. In most cases, you don't need surgery. Not with current technology. Recent data have shown an almost equivalency between bypass surgery and ballooning and stenting. Except in certain situations where we can't stent a few. And that's very rare. And the reason people don't like it is they're like this guy, all right? 
Nobody wants to go and have open heart surgery. So we try and do it with an invasive. We talk to the patient, we crack a few jokes, before you know it is done. Believe me, right? Okay, so femoral, groin approach, wrist approach, the radial artery, you may feel your pulse. Just go up that two millimeter tube. That's what we call angioplasty. Okay? Through here or up there. And this is how we do it. This is how we do it. You pass the catheter up here and onto a block, balloon and stent. You notice there's not a lot of words in this talk. I'm trying to keep you all awake. As soon as I said that, three people yawned. <laughs> and you know who you are. It's okay. We won't point you out. This is how we balloon and stent. Okay, can you see that? And the stent is a scaffold sitting in there to hold the artery open. It's very simple, that little spring, and it does not set off metal detectors, don't worry. I've been asked this a hundred times by now. Okay? Small bit of metal. And this is the new way, through the arm, right in there, pass the catheter up, small tube. It's like playing a video game. We go in, we steer through, we open it up, we come out, win a prize, everything's good. <laughs> Alright? New route, up the arm, old route. Can you see that? Okay, and in there, small tube, tiny little, tiny little tube. At the end of it, this is all you get. Okay, you can't see it. Not so bad. I think I've won over a few people. I'm quite happy now. <laughs> and then you go to block, as I said, we pass a tube through, pass a wire through, balloon it. Can you see that? And the problem is if you balloon it, it tends to squeeze back in. Okay? So you balloon it open. In the old days, we only balloon. Actually, in the old days, you only get bypass surgery. I'm going to tell you about that in a while. You balloon it open over a wire. Take out the balloon, because we don't leave the balloon behind. I've been asked this many times too. We pull the balloon out. We leave the stent behind, holding the artery open. Like that. Metal stent, tiny. Okay, really tiny now. Huh? Sitting in there, and you push all the stuff aside, and your body heals itself. Okay, you can see that? Yeah, the body heals itself. Up here. We even fix 100% blocks. In the old days we couldn't. Now we can't, but it's cool technology, all kinds of stuff. 100% block. Balloon. It recoils on itself. Okay? And then after that, we put a stent in and it stays open. And I told you, right, in the early days, all we had was bypass. I said not so many words. Okay, one slide of words. Forgive me. Alright? 1980. All we had before 1980 was bypass surgery. And then we started ballooning some dude called Brunswick. Cool guy. Okay? He opened up people's arteries with a balloon. We had bare metal stents in the 90s, so from the 80s to the 90s, just metal stents, 30% used to reblock. With a balloon alone, 50%. And we got better and better each decade. Drug eluting stents, medicated stents. You've all heard about the stents that are medicated. Okay? And the latest 2010, latest generation of drug eluting stents, the reblockage rate is less than 5% in the right hands. We say 5 to 20 because there's a range moving around, but if you use the technology I'm going to show you in a few minutes, you bring that down to less than 5% chance of your lifetime of a reblock. Bypass surgery has a 50% chance of reblockages. Did anyone know that? No? I'll tell you. Okay, so latest generation stents. Bioabsorbable stents made out of a polymer that disappears and goes away. Okay? Disappears, but it takes five years to fully disappear, right? And this is the video showing how you put that bioabsorbable stent in, like a normal stent, sitting there, holds a scaffold, holding it open. After six months, it starts to dissolve and go away. By two years, most of it's gone. By three years, four years, almost all of it's disappeared. We use this in younger patients, generally, because you need to be able to take blood thinning medicines for a longer period of time compared to the mental states. Okay, so there's always there's always a plus and a minus. So for people who have high bleeding risk, we try not to use this. Okay? And then it goes in, drug comes out, and over time it dissolves, it goes away. 
I gotta wait for this. Oops. I think it jammed. Okay. Very good files. Alright? But that's what it looks like, is it sits inside the arteries. And then it heals, okay? Using special technology. But we don't just stop there. So, you know, a lot of people say, ah, what's the advantage of going to Mount Elizabeth Hospital, getting in treatment done there? So expensive. Yeah, I do get that from time to time. But we try to use some of the better equipment as well. If an artery does not need to be fixed, we can pass a wire down, measure the pressure across it. Some people come in with like 10, 15 blocks. And then after we measure the pressure across, we decide we only need to fix two or three. The rest can be treated medically. You put in less tense. You do less bleeding instead. Okay? And this is called a pressure wire. You can ask any of your family members who are going in for a procedure, you can ask, oh, you're going to do a pressure wire on that, on that lesion, on that blockage. And that will tell you that if the pressure drop is not big, you don't really need to fix that artery. Okay? It's called a pressure wire. Pass a wire through, you see this is a block. And for this guy, okay, it was significant. Okay? So we opened it. Right? So I'm just telling you a little few few different concepts. Okay, don't worry about the numbers. And then we can look at the inside of the artery. After we put a stent in, before we put a stent in, we look at the inside of the artery. We can see if we put the stent properly, if you need to put a stent in. The people have talked to I don't know, angio, balloon, stent, come out. We can put catheters in, use ultrasound, look at the inside of the artery, and make sure that we're doing the right thing for the patient. And these are the new bits of technology that we have. We visualize the inside of the artery, but this is not quite as cool, okay, as the next one, where you can see the inside of the artery like this. Beautiful, clean pictures. We can tell if our stents can put in properly. And studies have shown that if you use this kind of technology to put the stent in, it stays there and the chance of reblocking is almost zero. And when we compare this kind of technology to the old angiogram alone or the CT scan, it is like clarity of a picture, okay? Cool, blur, pretty good, no, very nice, full technical. Everyone remember technical? Wrong generation. <laughs> the old days, right? But anyway, full clean arteries. Okay, and that's what we have. This is a recent course we held next door uh, at Mount Elizabeth, teaching people from this region how to use this kind of technology. Okay, at least of course, I, I put this up in most of my slides. We just done October 26th. It's the first time we've done it in second world, this kind of course. Okay, and this is us showing them live, in a live case, how to open up an artery using special technology, passing wires down. You don't need to watch the whole thing, don't worry. Okay, and we see the inside. This is the inside. You know, you talk about pictures of the, of the heart, pictures of the arteries. This is the inside of the artery. You can see exactly what's happening in the artery. If I try to explain all this to you, it'll be a bit tough, okay? But this is basically somebody where someone else had put in a stent for them, and it wasn't opened up adequately, and it looked nice in the angio. They came in with a heart attack. And then, when we did this examination, we found that it wasn't touching the wall. That's why that patient had a re-block. If you've heard about stents, people tell you stents blocking, stents collapsing. Stents don't collapse. What you get is a re-block inside the artery, okay? And there are reasons for that. So if you use this technology when you implant from the beginning, it costs a bit more, unfortunately. You get much better results. And this is what it looks like, right through. It's like, it's like you're flying right through the artery, okay? And you see some cooler pictures in a while. These are pictures just of the inside of the artery, beautiful, clean pictures. So you've got your artery sitting on top, that tube, you're actually looking at the inside of it, okay? And you get beautiful pictures that correlate with the angiogram, which I showed you. So you're all becoming experts now. When you go back, you'll know what an angiogram looks like. And people ask, yeah, yeah, I know about that OCT technology. Yeah, yeah, it's all right. You know, you can show off to people as well, okay? But what you can see, this is like a fly through. Can you see this inside of the artery? We can actually see that is these white things. Those are stents. We can see the inside and see the stent is actually holding up against the wall. We have this technology. We've been using this for a while now. In fact, when I was in Germany about 15 years ago, we were trying to play with the prototypes of this, now 15, 10, 10 years ago. 
And you can see these beautiful pictures on the inside. You can see that it goes against the wall, the archery. And that's a scent for you. Can you see this? That's a scent of what it looks like inside the archery. Is this too complex? Yeah, so it's a bit complex. But I'm telling you, you can use this kind of technology just to look at the inside. You see beautiful pictures like that of the archery. Okay? And more pictures for the same. And I'm just going to show you one or two more. This is someone where we did an angiogram for them. This is the archery. All this is blocked. What you see is flow inside the vessel. And then no flow coming down here. Can you appreciate that? Yeah? Can everyone appreciate it? It's not too complex, I hope. Okay? Block, block, block. This guy was told nothing can be done. Can't bypass because you can't find an, an artery to bypass onto. Almost cannot stand because nowhere. They can't open up all these 100% blocks. But we managed to open it up for them. Opened up everything, ballooned it, put in bioabsorbent stents that dissolved over time. Four years later, his arteries are all opened up and it's good. So we can do the near impossible these days. Not the impossible, but near, near enough. This guy had to do the rounds. Other people said that they couldn't fix it, but we managed to fix it. Okay? This is a picture of stents. After an angiogram, after a balloon, after a stent, what do you do? You want to know if your artery is open? You can do a CT scan. You don't necessarily need another angiogram. CT scans can show you the arteries and the stents with the right technology using modern equipment. Okay? This is a CT scan of a stent. And this is a bioabsorbable one where, you, where it's completely dissolved and all you have are two small markers. This is the artery going down, two small markers on the inside. Okay? And it's always better, okay? Now, in, in the worst case scenario, bypass. You've all heard about bypass, right? Bypass, open heart surgery. Everyone's heard this. I'm trying to keep you awake. You take an artery from inside, take an artery from your leg, and stick it on. And you bypass the block. But you don't take away. Everyone thinks you scrape up the old block, you don't. And it doesn't mean you've got a new heart. Bypass grafts, the vein grafts, 50% of these reblock. block These 10% reblock. block So we're stenting a lot of bypass grafts now. But rarely do you ever need to do a redo bypass. Almost zero. Okay? And of course the downside is scar. This is a nice scar, by the way. It's a very good scar. Okay? If you've seen people bypass surgery, they don't always look like this. As opposed to this. Okay, still doing good for time. Right, I'm going to show you just a few more slides. Okay? Try and wake up the one, two people who yawned again. Every time I say wake up, somebody yawns. I don't know why. It's like a trigger. Okay? I'm going to flip, flip, and I'm just going to show you. Remember this echo? Ultrasound scan of the heart. People have valve problems. Not all heart disease is blocks. Not all heart disease is abnormal heart rhythm. Sometimes valves get messed up. This is somebody with a messed up valve that doesn't open. Okay? And in the old days, all we could do was open heart surgery. This is what a calcified block valve looks like. This is a normal valve. It's like a Mercedes Benz sign. This is a Mercedes Benz sign. And this Mercedes Benz has got a whole load of stuff around it. Okay? And it can't open. In the old days, all you could do was surgery. Now, we can do it with a catheter. We, I used to do my angiograms from the leg. More than 10, 10 years ago, we switched to the arm, easier for patients. But here we have to put a bigger tube on. So we still do it from the leg. We pass a tube on, and we balloon instead the valve. No open heart surgery. Tabby, transcatheter aortic valve implantation. We always give you long words so you can't remember what it is. <laughs> okay? Mercedes Benz opened. Mercedes Benz can't really open. Yeah? In the old days, you had to just fix it with a valve. But now, we can put a stent like this with a valve inside. So this is just articles we've written. And this is how it's done. I hope you can see it. Okay. Uh, yeah, I can't see it from here. But you can see that it goes in, same way. Go in there, open up the valve. Stick a new one inside. Pretty cool. And then at the end of it, 
You don't have this. You can see this. But you get this small dot. And one small dot here, and that's it. Pretty cool. Impressed? No, not impressed. Okay, technology. Alright? So that's what it is. Small, small puncture wounds, minimally invasive, fix everything that we can. But we move back to the beginning as well. Because you don't want to get to that point. Okay? So what you want to do is prevent yourself getting there. So if you are having a problem, preempt, take the medication. But if you have a problem, we live in an age where we can fix it. It's not the end of the world. Local anesthesia, we can fix most of these things. Not a problem. Okay? That's the message I want to get to you. Okay? And this guy, guess how old he is? Yeah, you girls are very good. <laughs> okay, you can read, right? Okay, he's 80 years old now. He keeps running marathons. He's had angioplasty several times. He's actually a doctor. But these guys are obviously running with him, in case. But anyway, he doesn't have marathons. Sure, they have to run with him, right? Okay, completed seven half marathons after Andrew. He's 80 years now, he's still doing it. Okay, so it doesn't mean you can't go back to a normal life. You can. But most important, for you and your loved ones, look through this list. Try and do what you can to reduce your risk factors. Early health screening, medication. Look, medicine helps. Until we get a better medication, the statins and the cholesterol tablets, they reduce your risk of getting a heart attack by 50%. Potential side effect risk 1 in 10,000. Okay? Small patched roof house compared to Empire State Building. Okay? Benefit and risk. All right? And thank you. I think, I think there was a mention earlier about whether people wanted to ask questions for a few minutes. Okay, looks like we've got a bit of time for a couple of minutes. So, any question there? Anyone? Yes, ma'am. If you're really stuck, I'll try and do the dermatology questions to Lynn as well, but I'm not that good at those. Everywhere, 
one area where it starts and it tends to grow very fast. So what they told you about your liver producing cholesterol is true. But in everybody, the liver produces cholesterol. In everybody, the amount of food you eat is converted into cholesterol as well. But for some people, they have a genetic predisposition. It's like a switch has been turned on. And they're unlucky, because that switch has been turned on. I told you about the guys where the switch has been turned off, where they have a special gene that doesn't produce LDL. You have the converse, where people have a gene that keeps producing LDL. Now for those people, the treatment's still the same. What you need to do is get your cholesterol down. I had patients come to me and they told me, oh, uh, someone told me my cholesterol is genetic. So genetic means I don't need to do anything about it. That's not true. Even more so, because the higher the cholesterol circulating, the higher the chance of that body sticking against the wall and causing a blockage. Okay, so it's true on both counts. Food does contribute to your cholesterol. Now you may have heard the story where the FDA it has been certainly in the WhatsApp. I keep getting my, I get sent this about once a week by my patients. They told me, oh, cholesterol doesn't cause blocks. The FDA said it's not associated with the amount of cholesterol you ingest. It's true, it's not the amount of cholesterol, it's the amount of total calories, sugar and fat. You just cut that down. And then the excess that you have doesn't go in as tummy fat in the same way as fat lining the arteries of your heart. And the arteries elsewhere, the neck, leg, we stand all this. I hope that answers your question. Any other questions? Okay, so I'm not saying bypass is bad. There is a role for bypass. Certain patients bypass suits them better. First of all, what you get is you get to address, I'll tell you what, I'll give you, can I put this somewhere? Because I'm not going to use this anymore. You get to address all the blockages in one go. So let's say somebody comes in, we do an angiogram. There are three big arteries plus a fourth up there. And you've got like eight to ten areas, you're going to need eight to ten stents to open it up. In such a case, we would offer bypass surgery as the first option. Because otherwise, eight to ten stents, first of all, is very expensive. Secondly, there's a whole lot of metal you're going to put in, a lot of contrast. Most of the time, when I give patients the option, they will still prefer not to have bypass done. And what they have done is ballooning and stenting. Studies now have shown with the current technology, bypass and stenting is equivalent in terms of outcomes. If you need to put loads of stents in, there might be a slight advantage in bypass in terms of not needing further procedures. But the recovery is very long. If you go in, if I do a stent from the radio from the arm, the patient sits up within four hours, goes to the toilet and can walk. Next day they go home. Bypass surgery you stay in hospital one week. It takes you one month before you can go back to work. So the recovery is longer. The initial risk of ballooning and stenting done in the, with the right people, in the right hands. So I can't give you a blanket statement. Everywhere you go it's going to be the same. The risk is 1-2% to two percent at the most. But for bypass surgery they quote you 5% risk heart attack, stroke, whatever. But when you get past the first month after the bypass, your risk goes down significantly. So that's the difference between the two. So I mean, if you had a chance and a choice, I know a lot of heart surgeons, but I'm a cardiologist, so I don't do open heart, I do balloon stents. Heart surgeons, whom I have actually done ballooning and stenting for, for them, because they would prefer it for themselves in that scenario. But from a cost perspective, if you're going to do bypass, it doesn't cost as much in the government sector. Okay, so there is a cost issue involved with it too. I hope that explains some of what you asked. We got any other questions? Yes, ma'am. So heart murmur, if you look up in the dictionary, um, I'm not sure whether Webster's or otherwise, but a murmur is a sound. So you hear murmurs, you know, meaning somebody's saying something, right? A murmur is just a sound, an abnormal sound in your heart that someone hears using a stethoscope. In the early days, we didn't have stethoscopes. The, surgery, the doctors used to put their ear to the chest. Did you know that? People actually did that in the early days, okay? But when you listen, what you hear with a heart sound is dum dum, dum dum, dum dum, right? Everyone should know this. 
But the murmur is a sound where you get a dum, whoosh, dum. Okay? And that's all a murmur is, it's a sound. What causes a murmur is a different thing altogether. Murmurs can be caused by valves opening and closing and not opening and closing well. Okay? So if a valve cannot open fully, you get turbulent flow. If a valve opens too much and can't close fully, you get turbulent flow. So that murmur or that sound comes from turbulent flow. So what she asked me was, what is a murmur? Okay, so murmur is a sound caused by some kind of abnormality in the heart. Sometimes there are minor abnormalities. Some people have turbulent flow in a valve without an actual valve problem. Let me tell them that is a benign flow murmur, they're fine. If the valve has an abnormality and it's mild or moderate, we observe it. If it's severe, it might need to be fixed, either with surgery or with the catheter therapy that I showed you earlier on. Sometimes it's from a hole in the heart. Now, you all may not know this, but we all have holes in the heart when we sit in our mommy's womb. That's because we get oxygen from mom. We're not using one side of the heart. When the baby comes out and then it goes, it comes out, right? Then all of a sudden that pressure closes the holes. Sometimes it doesn't close fully and it takes a month to three months to close the baby. So a lot of babies have murmurs, okay? But in some people it never closes that hole in the heart between the two chambers. And those people might or might not need surgery at some point. So I hope that answers your question as well, yes? Yes, ma'am. The valve is tight. The blood cannot go through. 
So what happens is your heart is straining, so it starts getting thicker and thicker and thicker, and it can get enlarged as well. So it can cause enlargement of the heart. So what she asks is whether a murmur can cause, it is not the murmur, but the cause of the murmur. Okay? But what is causing that sound? Some of those things can cause enlargement. Any other questions? We don't have for time, but any other questions? Anybody else? Yes, ma'am? Okay, so once again, you've egg they asked eating a lot of eggs, does it cause high cholesterol? Okay? Yes. Yes. The egg industry would have you believe that it doesn't. Okay, because they want to sell you eggs, right? What is the yellow? The yellow is a big lump of fat. The white is a whole load of protein. You can eat as much white as you like, not a problem. But if you eat loads and loads of the yolk, your cholesterol will go up. Not because that's full of cholesterol. I'm going to tell you a little bit about prawns in a short while as well, okay? Because everyone knows this about seafood, right? I'm sure that question is going on. But lumps and lumps of fat like this go into your body, get processed, Go into your liver, come out, get stuck to the wall. And the circulating cholesterol goes up. So I've got a lot of like these bodybuilder guys who come in and say, oh, I eat 20 eggs a day. 20 eggs a day. And you wonder why your cholesterol is high. So I told you, you can eat your 20 egg whites. Okay? You can eat two to three yolks a week, no problem. It won't cause a problem. Your body can process it. But if you eat loads and loads of egg yolk, it'll get converted. Same way if you've got steak and you've got this big rib of fat around the side. Okay? You should be throwing that fat away. But some people love the fat, so they eat all that fat too. And then they wonder why their cholesterol's gone up. And then a lot of people tell me, my cholesterol's really high, but I don't eat a lot of seafood, you know? The seafood thing is a misconception. Okay? If you eat prawns, how much fat is lined in that prawn? Very little. But when they used to do it in the early tests, they found that there was more cholesterol-laden fat than not. But it doesn't matter whether it's cholesterol or otherwise. Fat is fat, sugar is sugar, carbs are carbs. You eat in excess of what you need, it gets converted. Same way as well. If you eat rice like that every day, okay, and some people do. Well, I did it as a teenager, and now it's like the size of your fist. And you shouldn't eat more than the size. You know, this, this fist thing is very good. You hold it up, not more than that, in rice. Some of you might be thinking, God, my fist is really small compared to this one. Is that all the rice I'm going to get? Okay, one and a half for you. Those are small fists, okay? But that's all the rice you can, you, you can take, okay? But if you eat loads of rice, it's going to get converted. You eat loads of meat, it's going to get converted. Loads of eggs. How many eggs do you eat a day? I'm kidding. Yeah. You can eat a few egg whites, throw away the yolk. Now, I had this story, I told, we told one patient to throw away the yolk. We didn't realize he didn't understand which one the yolk was. <laughs> so six months later, he comes in, let's throw, I throw away the yolk all the time. Said, okay, then what do you do? Okay, but you eat the white, right? The white, he says, no, isn't that the yolk? <laughs> so he threw away the white and, and ate all the yellow. Okay, so I learned my lesson, so now I tell them, yellow and white, okay? All right? Okay. Are we good? So I think, I think they're telling me I'm, I'm done, to some degree. So I have one last question. Okay, can we do one last question and stop? I'm sorry, apologies. Can some people still eat three or more eggs a day and the cholesterol can remain low? Those are very lucky people. <laughs> so you look at life, and life isn't always fair. I'd like to be seven foot two and you know a um, basketball player, but I can't be that person. Okay? Same way, some people are, you know, are sprinters and they can do whatever they like. Some people have been given genes that allow them to process whatever they take in. Just like some guys who smoke you never get an issue. But they're like one in a thousand. The same way, so she asked me, can some people keep eating eggs?
three or more a day and keep their cholesterol low. If those people are able to do it, they're lucky. That means they're able to metabolize and process it. And what we find that usually is young people in their teens and 20s who are able to do this, because their metabolism is really fast. Let's talk, talk about metabolism, right? Your metabolism is able to cope. But when you're 40, 50, 60, it's not going to work for you. And if you remember what I told you about the level of cholesterol you need to be at, the people that tell you their cholesterol is low despite eating all this eggs, they're actually high, but just at the borderline of the upper limit of normal for bad cholesterol. If you run between 100 and 130, you will get a block. If you run below 50, you almost never get a block. Okay, for the bad cholesterol or LDL. So it does impact and it increases your risk for sure. So three eggs a day, sure. Five eggs a day, no problem. Egg white. Okay? So I think we have to move on to the next section, right? Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you.